Good evening, everybody. Um, as you guys are making your way to your seats, I want to thank uh, Chef Jeff and the Metals Cafe. Thank you so very much. Let's give them a round of applause. You know, that fruit looks so good, almost looked like a work of art, that I didn't want to disturb it, so instead I, I got the cookies. That's, 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 oh, that's yeah, the right. only reason why <laughs> I got the cookies. He's pitiful. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I know this is a busy time of the year for everyone, and we appreciate uh, your coming here uh, on this very important event. Uh, I want to thank, um, I know I'm going to leave some names out, but I do want to thank the entire University of Rochester team, uh, the uh, members of the Rochester Teachers Association that helped us uh, get to this point today. I think some of them are over there. Um, I see some administration officials uh, from East High here as well. I see Karen from the Parent Association uh, back there. And I promised Karen I would give her a plug before the meeting started. The, 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 let's give the PTA a round of applause. <laughs> They are uh, meeting tomorrow, uh, uh, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock in the Metals Cafe. Uh, we would encourage parents to attend. Uh, you know, we think we have all the answers, uh, some of us with fancy degrees behind our names. But there are parents with and without those degrees that are a vital part of making East High School a success. So please, once again, let's encourage them for the work that they uh, have done and will do. Thanks again, Karen. And without, uh, Thank you. sure, and uh, you should know normally in a meeting like this we uh, uh, ask if there are any speakers. We don't have any speakers, uh, but we do have a very important presentation, and that is by the folks of uh, East, uh, the University of Rochester, uh, Steve Eubing. The floor is yours. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Van. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I too would like to thank a few folks. Uh, I'd like to thank the board. Uh, Van has been a, uh, a great uh, inspiration and steward of this effort. Uh, I can tell you that uh, there, when Van first came to us and asked us to consider doing this, we very politely said no. And uh, the guy just keeps coming back and stronger <laughs> and stronger. He's uh, persistent and relentless, and here we are. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, President Seligman here someplace. Joel? Right in front of me. Right in front of me. Don't hide like that. Uh, it's really his vision to do something that's uh, very much out of the box for our, for our university, and, uh, and it really puts the university's reputation on the line, and all of our uh, efforts are focused on the students at East High School. But uh, it was his vision to make this contribution that allowed us to move forward. Our dean, Rafael Brazzi, is here. And uh, she, too, was able to create this sense of how can we serve our community. Uh, we've had great relationships as we've gone through this with uh, all of the uh, constituent groups here at East. Uh, that includes parents, uh, students. We met with virtually every student, at least every student was here that day. Uh, we've had great relationships with the Rochester Teachers Association. Kyle Crandall and his group is, are back there. We've spent more time together than either one of us really wants to, but uh, <laughs> that has gone, uh, produced uh, really, I think, great results. Our colleagues from Bente and RAP, our colleagues from ASAR, uh, all working on trying to make modifications to existing agreements to better serve the needs of kids at East High School. So I'd also like to thank my own colleagues who have been with me from beginning to end. It really was Joanne Larson who motivated me to take my role in this, Bonnie Rubenstein, I've, uh, Mike and Mike and Gary and Bethany and Susan and Mary. I know I'm forgetting people, so forget me, forgive me rather. Martha's there, Laura's there, uh, Mary's there, and thank you everybody for being there and helping us move forward. Cindy Clark, who's the head of the Warner Center, who really is, um, is kind of the framework for our work. The last person I want to thank uh, who has been incredibly diligent, and this is kind of interesting because every single employee in the new East High School will be hired anew. Many, of course, will be people who are already at East. Some will not be at East. And every person knows they have to come forward and, and be considered 
to be part of the new East High School. Um, Annabelle Salar has been just terrific in providing us with support, um, in, uh, in giving us uh, logistical information, in helping us to understand what works and doesn't work here. And last but not least, I want to thank all of the folks at Central. We've had great support from the superintendent's office, the assistant superintendents, and everybody else at Central. We said on day one, we're entering this as a partnership, not a competition. And that has certainly been, been the hallmark of all of our work. And, and I think we were able to move forward because we had this sense of collaboration and, and, and trying to build a, a better future for the young men and women who attend this institution. So with that, I'm going to go through this um, slideshow. I'm going to ask that questions be held to the end, and then I will uh, accept questions, including from the board. But if we ask questions in the beginning, we may not get to the end. And uh, so I tend to wander when I do these things. I tend, people who've seen me do this know that I tend not to look at the slide, and I'll start talking about something that's not up there. So just, just be kind to me, and be, be lenient in your appraisal if I do that, because it's, uh, it's one of my quirks, and hopefully it won't be too bad today. So here's where we started, way back uh, when Van first came to see us and Annabelle came to see us. Uh, East had had a long series of uh, issues involving New York State assessments. Uh, it had been through several stages of restructuring, and now the state said it's an out-of-time school, which meant the board had five choices for East. One, to close the building. What a disgrace that would be. Two, to become a charter school. And that certainly is always a possibility if there's a charter company or institution would take it over. None came forward. Uh, three, operate under SUNY. There is no SUNY campus here in, Buff in, in Rochester, but there are SUNY campuses in the general area. Uh, four is to phase out, and that would mean no seventh graders, then no eighth graders, et cetera, et cetera. Or well, last, to operate under an educational partnership organization. And, and that's what the board asked us to do. An EPO can be any university, can be a library, can be a museum. But you, you must know that the State Education Department, I think if, if the commissioner were here, they'd agree, really didn't have this scoped out completely as to what that would mean and how it would work. The legislation's there. We can get some guidance from it. But in the final analysis, what they were asking the University of Rochester to do was to become the district for East High School. Not that we wouldn't still be part of the Rochester City School District, answerable to the Board of Education, but we would essentially be a separate district within a district with our own superintendent. And that, by the way, impacts how we put this together and some of the things that, that end up uh, uh, com coming down in terms of governance, but we'll get there as we move along. So as I said, we said no. Uh, I remember saying to Van, you mean? that we would take over the same school with the same people, same budget, same kids, same everything. The only thing would be different that I'd be there and my colleagues, why, why, why do you think that would change anything? And if you look at the legislation, it says no, people who work at East High School are going to have to be people who want to work there, who, who buy into what you've accomplished or, or what you've uh, proposed. Um, you can submit your own budget to the board uh, to take into consideration. Um, you can look at the, re-look re at the curriculum, re-look at um, uh, uh, educational practice, assessments, uh, how the school uses data, et cetera, how the school reaches out to families and community. And you can create a separate proposal that the board would consider, and that's what we're doing tonight. So stay with me, if you will, with this little analogy. <clears throat> Does anybody want to guess how long it took me to draw that little stool? No, I found it online. Uh, so think of this analogy. Success is based on the three-legged stool analogy. There's three things that have to be present to build a successful enterprise, especially in an urban environment. And just for the record, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, attended Sheepshead Bay High School uh, freshman year, and so I have some background in an urban environment as a child. Of course, that wasn't that recently, but, <laughs> but, but I was there. So the first leg of that stool is having the right people. Having people show up to work every day who say, this is where I want to work. This is the work I want to do. This is, these are the kids I want to deal with. And so I want to be at East High School. I am all in all the time. And this is my choice. That's powerful, as opposed to this is where I ended up. And so we were able to agree on a process for how we would collectively choose 
of faculty and staff based on people who chose to be here, who buy into the all-in approach, and, and uh, are willing to engage in intensive, ongoing professional learning for faculty and staff. I'll say a quick thing about professional learning. I want, I want you to think about this analogy. You're lying in bed the day before some very uh, in, scary surgery. It's invasive. It's major. Um, you're trying to collect yourself, and there on TV, Dr. Sandra Gupta on, at CNN just announced there's a new approach to this surgery that's not invasive at all, that can be done on an outpatient basis with remarkable success. And just then, your doctor, your surgeon looks in and says, well, you ready for the big day tomorrow? And you say, doctor, doctor, are you aware of this new approach that's non-invasive that will get me out of the hospital in a couple of days? He says, you know, I heard something about that, but I really haven't had time to look into it. Could you imagine how you would react to that? It's important that our teachers and our principals, our, our, our teaching assistants, are all on the cutting edge of what works with kids. What does research say will work, and what can we do to be sure that we implement it in a way that's going to be effective? That's what we mean by intensive, ongoing professional learning. The second stool is, this is a nice segue into that. The second leg of the stool is using best practice. Um, we decided, you know, that, that we wouldn't redefine best practice. We would go to the state of New York, which evaluates this school, which will visit this school. I don't know when the visit is uh, next year, uh, with a joint intervention team, and we'll apply a rubric called the Diagnostic Tool uh, for School and District Effectiveness in evaluating uh, school performance and progress uh, out of the on-time status. And rather than push back and say we agree or disagree, uh, re-examine those practices, we said from the beginning, we'll accept this as the state's definition of best practice and we will design the school around that rubric. And if you look at the proposal, you'll see it's closely aligned to the, what we call affectionately the ditzy rubric. Um, and, and, and we added one, one tenet, by the way, this six tenets in the ditzy rubric. We added student life because it's very important to us that kids at East have a voice and that their voice is seen and felt throughout the school, that they have a strong sense that this is their school, this is a place they want to be, this is a place where they can learn, and by the way, have fun. You know, did anybody ever agree that school shouldn't be fun? It should be an enjoyable, engaging experience that kids look forward to, and they choose to come here, just like our staff chooses to be here every single day. So that's our design structure, okay? What do we mean by best practice? High quality, engaging curriculum, assessment, and instructional practices, things that the research says work, especially in an urban environment. Um, we use these practices, we implement them with fidelity. We, we make them work for our setting, and then we implement them with the guidance of people who have helped design those practices. Now, I'll give you an example of, of, of one such person in a second. And we implement them with absolute fidelity into our setting. So maybe, the, most, the foremost expert on assessment development in the United States is Rick Stiggins from the Assessment Training Interview, uh, Institute in Portland, Maine, in Portland, Oregon, rather, since retired. He's working with us directly to help implement a high quality, best practice in assessment development implementation and then data use in how we uh, uh, look back in those assessments to improve student achievement. Um, our work is based on what the research says will work. Uh, we, we visited numerous uh, schools where these uh, curriculum instructional practices have been implemented. We actually had um, uh, uh, several trips to Buffalo. I went to Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, we've been to Syracuse. Uh, we've gone to local schools in the Rochester area, and we've looked to see where these practices work, and we have a good sense of how we're gonna implement them to, be, to ensure effectiveness. On a school-wide basis, we, we, we're developing this school around the concept of leadership. Every person, now, redefine leadership for me, with me, if you will. Every person has the potential to be a leader. And that leadership might be very personal. It may be uh, something that uh, is, is, is impacted in a small way or a large way. 
the concept of the leader being the, the, the guy on the horse with the, with the sword yelling charge is over. Leadership is about collaboration. Leadership is about knowing how to uh, uh, find your place and create a place in a group and move the group forward to maintain your individuality, your culture, but at the same time find a way to interact with others in an effective way. So at, at the, you're going to see this sense of leadership develop throughout our presentation and then throughout the implementation of this plan. Um, School-wide, you're going to see an emphasis on dual language. Uh, we believe that the dual language approach um, for uh, the students who are English or, or ENL, English as a new language, you've got to get the right acronym, the, the state just changed it, is the most effective way to move students forward through the New York State curriculum. Um, you'll see very active uh, support, uh, a very, very active support model for students with disabilities, um, where we are actually uh, very in tune to the specific needs of each child and creating plans around those, ch that those children to be successful. Every student, this is really important, every student will be known in a small group, a small supportive group, with an adult leading that group to support their social emotional needs and their other needs, their organizational needs, their getting to school on time needs, their issues at home needs, their preparation starting to think about jobs and work needs, their getting ready to think about college needs. And so everybody in our school who is uh, uh, all the instructional folks and many of the other folks who choose to do this work will be involved in helping to support kids as they go through school in these small uh, 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 family groups. Now, we are not sure how many will be in the groups, probably eight or nine. Uh, we'd like five, but we don't have enough teachers to make five. Um, they'll meet every day. They'll do cool things. Sometimes they'll meet, and they'll meet together. Sometimes they'll collaborate. But every student will feel that he or she is known by a special adult, in addition to their teachers, their coaches, and everybody else. And, every, and the administrators will also take these groups. Every counselor will have a group. Every student will feel they're part of this. Um, we believe that our families, now by that I mean our families and the communities, are key to the success of our students. And we believe that our families desperately want their kids to be successful and supported at East High School. And we will actively uh, outreach and involve families in decision-making about the school, in, in decision-making about the kids. We'll help them to feel welcome and known and, and part of the overall uh, instructional process. I left out an important group there. The other group is the kids themselves. The kids, as I said earlier, need to have a voice. Their voice needs to be recognized. They need to, be, they need to feel that what they say is, is heard, that it's important, that they're treated with respect and dignity, and they're held to a high standard of respect and dignity themselves, that uh, they're engaged in restorative justice practices so that they can be held accountable themselves for their own actions and help grow, for, grow through a process that values their dignity towards uh, being even better people than they are today. So the curriculum will, we, we intend the curriculum be engaging, inquiry-based, student-centered, culturally relevant, responsive, authentic, interest-driven, immersed in the community. And, and that'll be generated through in-depth ELA and math double periods for extra time and literacy and math fundamentals. Um, one of the things you'll see when we talk, talk, talk about capacity is we will introduce um, certified reading teachers into the mix at East so that teachers who teach ELA and social studies, and actually all teachers, can draw from the strength of the certified reading teachers to help kids deal with whatever issues they may have in, in reading, uh, in literacy development. Um, our work is based on next generation science uh, for, for college and career life. Um, Michael is here, he can talk more about the science curriculum, but there's gonna be heavy emphasis on physics, which is the, the gateway science, we believe, um, and prepares, prepares our kids best for the rest of the high school science curriculum. Our instruction's gonna be research-based, structured and child-centered, thoughtful, integrated, challenging, creative, career-informed, and collaborative. We, it's designed to teach young people both academic and social skills, and based on the belief that young people can and want to be in charge of their own learning. That's very key there. Young people can and want to be in charge of their own 
learning. And, th and we think there's a lot of research to, to substantiate that. Uh, we will take very, very seriously, and I'd like to compliment the board for adding this year four social workers. You know, kids who grow up in urban environments have different social emotional needs, and, and they need to be supported in special ways. So there are additional social workers in the building this year, uh, thanks to the actions of the, of the board. We will propose additional counselors, a ratio of 1 to 180. Uh, we'll make sure that we use other resources in the community. We have built and intend to uh, nurture uh, relationships with various community agencies that work for the benefit of, of the students in, in this, this neighborhood and specifically in this school. Because in the final analysis, anybody want to dispute that statement right there? Happy, healthy students, and by the way, other humans as well, <laughs> just tend to do better, you know? I mean, anybody here who says, you know, I do really, really well when I'm grumpy and depressed, let me know because we want to study you. We find that when kids are feeling better about what they're doing, who they are, they have a greater sense of, of their, own, their own place in the system, they tend to respond better and do better. Um, so I mentioned restorative practices, uh, build a culture east in which students have a voice and the, every student will have an adult advocate through their daily communications with their family, uh, small families. One of the keys that we believe, as I mentioned earlier, is this notion of family engage, engagement. Now the engagement's a critical word, okay? We're not talking about family involvement, you see. Involvement's different than engagement, think about that. We're talking about family feeling fully engaged, valued, welcomed, uh, part of the school. Um, we embrace the philosophy of partnership where information, decision-making, power, responsibility are authentically shared. And students and their families bring assets. We see every student and every family member coming to us with assets and our job is to discover and un uncover, discover and exploit, if you will, those assets to the benefit of the child. Um, we had a great day, unfortunately I wasn't here, but we came in with a, with a group of faculty, uh, several of our uh, Warner students, uh, and a number of uh, students from East. We went to every classroom and we gave the students a chance to interact with us about what they wanted to see at East High School. And, and one of the results is what you see tonight, better food. Uh, <laughs> It was, a, it was a great experience, I think, for them, but I can tell you it was even a more insightful experience for us. And, and we did some real research around that to help, us, help guide us in our decision making. Um, so the, the school that we intend is going to be different than the schools here now. Uh, it's eventually going to be smaller. It's not going to be smaller in year one. But it's going to be divided into two distinct parts. The lower school is going to be grades, listen to this, six, seven, and eight. We want sixth graders in the building so we can help develop those literacy skills early. We want those kids coming to school on yellow buses, and we want them coming a little earlier than the high school kids. Um, the, you're going to see a, a extensive time devoted to literacy and math. You're going to see reading teachers having an impact on those kids all the way through ninth grade and in high school. And the learning is going to be project-based combined with effective skills development. Both of those things will be given, given consideration in, in the curriculum. Um, Every kid will have, you see, the idea, here's the key. The idea is to have ideal first teaching and learning so that after the first teaching and learning is not necessary to remediate. So the re, you reteach at the spot and enrichment opportunities are, are provided for kids as they move through the process. Everybody knows this, I think, but in case you don't, the key is ninth grade. If you can get through ninth grade having passed five subjects, having passed at least one regents, the chances of you graduating are well over 90%. And so we're going to rethink ninth grade. Smaller classes, more support for our teachers, more special ed support, more ESL support, more reading support, more opportunity to double teach, more spiraled learning, uh, begin to talk about uh, CTE awareness, an expanded day for all students. And all students will have opportunities throughout this, this expanded day, both to reteach and relearn and to engage in enrichment opportunities. The upper school, the traditional high school, will have two looks. Now, I want to say something else about ninth grade for a second. The kids in the freshman academy will be true ninth graders. They will be kids coming out of eighth grade. So for the kids who are unsuccessful, 
in ninth grade, we have a different plan for them. I'll talk about that in a second. The upper school is, is a, uh, and, and again, the leadership piece is, piece is leadership for success. Here we're talking about leadership for innovation. Leadership to become change agents. Leadership to, be, to become socially responsible. Leadership to become uh, inventors, to become entrepreneurs, to become thinkers. Leadership in an area that's, uh, that, that it becomes the passion of the student. Um, so kids who are on track, ready to go, they'll be engaged in high quality academic and CTE programs, either or or both. Um, we'll have uh, build partnerships with area colleges, both the uh, the um, local community colleges will have a full AP curriculum for our kids. We'll challenge them, we'll push them, we'll look for them to be ready for college and be successful. Um, uh, the in-house CTE programs we already have, you've seen the results tonight with, with the great culinary uh, uh, program that's already at East and the other programs that already at East will build and nurture those programs. We'll add a program in partnership with the University of Rochester around health careers. We already have actually the beginnings of a health careers program in this building. Uh, we'll look for partnerships with area employers and agencies such as Hillside um, for internships, work experiences, and jobs. Our goal is to be able to say to every student in ninth grade, if you get out of here and you maintain reasonable attendance and a reasonable academic record, you will find a job or get into college, and we will work very hard to make that a reality for you. The problem is that some kids are not on track. And, and, and so in the first year we have, we anticipate, we'll have a number of ninth graders who failed most of, or if not all of ninth grade. Now what's been done in the past? Now let me just emphasize something. When I talk about the past, it's not meant to be a criticism. In no way are we criticizing, criticizing the practices of the Rochester City School District. In no way are we pointing fingers. All we're saying is what we know is is a fair amount of what's done in public education today, especially in urban education, hasn't been effective. And so we rethought this issue, what do we do when kids have failed virtually the entire ninth grade? We asked the question why they fail, we looked at the research, and the first thing we came up with is that often kids who fail ninth grade are driven by really bad attendance, tardiness, and absenteeism. And when we ask the question why that's happening, there's lots of answers, but one of which is, they don't deal well with the morning. Now, I don't know, any of you have teenagers at home? Raise your hand if you they, they up and at them, ready to go in the morning? You know, uh, often there is a, uh, good for you, often there's a small skirmish in my house uh, when the morning comes and we have teenagers staying there. So we're gonna, st we're gonna have an option for those kids to start later in the day, not much later, maybe more like 9, 9, 15, and to take classes that are focused on credit recovery that are focused on the standards, not put them in five classes so they can fail all five, because the history is, when you retake ninth grade, you fail it again. Almost every single kid who fails all of ninth grade then comes back the next year and, and takes it again, fails it. And then they eventually fail it again and drop out of school. So uh, we're gonna offer kids four options. The first is to come later, take standards-based compressed courses to move through the system more quickly, and as they're released from those standards-based courses, to be released into harder, uh, the, to sophomore level courses and get them caught up by the end of the year. As many kids as possible have gained credits after year two that make them eligible to be part sophomore, part junior. Option two is off-campus. We have two off-campus models that we're looking at. Um, one is a very engaging, nationally recognized program run by the Big Picture uh, Company. Uh, that's Dennis Litke's work. It's, I visited two of those schools. Annabelle, Raffaella uh, joined me on one of those visits. And this is a model based on project-based learning, small groups, internships. The school we visited in Lafayette really surprised us because they had a student population not dissimilar to ours, yet their region's results were, looked like a frankly, a, a, a high-performing suburban high school. And they were, the results were so good that the state came in and inspected them, assuming there must be something wrong here, and they were not. The kids were being successful because they were engaged, they were passionate about what they're doing. Let me tell you what happens often in, in um, school reform. Uh, companies come in, or agencies come in, or somebody comes in, and they say, we're gonna improve the graduation rate. And, one of the, and I'm not pointing fingers here at anybody. But one of the ways they improve it is they get rid of some of the kids. You see, they say, well, we know how to improve the graduation rate. 
Okay, we just got to drop all these kids from the rolls, push them out, or encourage kids to transfer, and guess what? Look what we did. We are not going to do that. Uh, the only students who would be encouraged to transfer are students for whom we don't have programs here, and they may have a program over at Edison that, that works better. We're going to try to reach out to every student, and that includes kids who are maybe two or three years out into the system. And so uh, Joanne and I are talking about a small, um, a, a small school approach, not dissimilar to the big picture model, but more geared towards the specific issues facing these kids in their lives, uh, working with the community agency to build skills and, and, and really be right into the home and getting kids back into this. This is going to be a very small group, maybe 20, 30 kids, but we're not giving up on those kids. We're trying to reach out, grab them, pull them back. We're not giving up on the 19 and 20 and 21 year olds who have dropped out. And when I mentioned East Evening, one of the things that will happen is East Evening is we'll have a GED program. So that if somebody wants to come back to school, start all over, we'll have an option for them to do that. Um, and we think that's incredible. My father uh, was a high school dropout, and he graduated high school taking a GED program at my high school where I was a student. And so it was a really tough thing for him. But without that, um, he wouldn't have had that opportunity. So also at East Evening, an opportunity for credit recovery for this fourth option for kids who have not been successful. Often kids can't come to school a day because they have very complicated lives. Often they are kids with kids of their own. They are kids who must work to put food on the table. They are kids who have other issues in their lives that uh, disallow them from coming to school. And so for an option for those kids will be to regain their credits uh, at East Evening. We don't have every particular worked out, what time it's going to open and close. It's not going to go to 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock at night, but we see it going as late as 7.30 or 8. Uh, one of my personal uh, goals is to provide driver education, by the way. It amazes me that every suburban school that I know of has driver education. I could be wrong. And why don't urban kids have driver education? Is it that they don't need it? I think uh, watching the kids drive, I think they could use it. And, <laughs> Uh, and there is a lot of research to suggest that driver education is a huge, has a huge economic return, uh, both in safety and in, in uh, p kids being able to get around and get to jobs and, and things of that nature. So the third stool is the toughest one. That's capacity. See, because capacity deals with how are we going to do all this. Um, we are going to add capacity to the school. Anybody who would suggest that we would just come here and rearrange all the chairs and have everybody sit in a new chair uh, and then everything would be good. Or we would come into the school and say, we're from the University of Rochester. And all the kids would say, oh, I gotta start studying now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Holy cow, Seligman's here. <laughs> you know? I better crack the books. So we never thought that was true. Um, there are areas where capacity is at issue. Uh, first, it, it, it makes sure the faculty are all in. Uh, make sure the kids have more time, that we improve initial teaching with better curriculum and better professional development for, our, for our, our faculty members, that the curriculum's culturally sensitive, that we have greater opportunities to spiral the curriculum and reteaching and relearning. So that, that's done through professional learning. So for those of you who don't know, uh, once upon a time, I haven't always had the soft life of a college professor, which has not been very soft in the last 10 months. Uh, I used to be the superintendent of schools in another city school, a small one. I won't say where, but it's on a lake, you know, and it's got a throughway exit, and uh, kind of So <laughs> I looked at my last budget that I put together, 2006-2007 budget, which is still on my laptop. And I noticed in that budget, putting it together for Canandaigua, I had the need to put in no security officers. In 06, 07, Canandaigua had zero security officers. We didn't have an SRO then. I know they have one now, but we did not then. We had zero ESSEL teachers. We had zero attendance personnel. The, the, the um, students with disabilities comprised about 12% of the population. This is just in the middle school and the high school. 95% attendance rate. In those two schools, we had three reading teachers. District-wide, we had 16. And we had a 21% free reduced lunch count. Now at East, I look at the budget. Before we even start, we already have 11 security personnel in the building. There is an SRO, 17.3 teachers for uh, students for whom English is a new language. There's two attendance workers already. At one point, we're thinking of four that could go back. There's, uh, 
students with disabilities comprise 24% of the population. Attendance is less than 80%. There are no reading teachers in this building right now, despite the fact that you know, kids come with serious literacy skills. And well over 90% of the kids are eligible for free reduced lunch. So the point I'm trying to make is that before you add one math teacher, before you can tweak one aspect of the budget, you're already dealing with, um, with very intense issues that affect urban education that don't affect the suburbs. And anybody who wants to see an urban setting in the same light as a suburban setting is probably going to be mystified by the challenges uh, that it's actually called municipal overburden. There are issues about being in a city uh, that you're just not going to get in the second ring suburbs. So what are we recommending for East High School? Uh, at this point, and this is still a developmental process, we have 16 new teachers in the budget. 11 of those are reading teachers, three are bilingual teachers. And you should know that the state regs have changed and the whole state is going to be adding ESL and bilingual teachers. My son is an ESL teacher. I told him he has full employment for the rest of his life uh, because there is, there is a shortage of, of, of ESL teachers. Uh, we'll have sixth grade teachers here, shifting the, that asset from other schools into ours. We have another a counselor and a half uh, so that we can maintain the 180 to 1. Oh, by the way, in Canada, I had 250 calendars, counselors to 1. And I'm asking for 180 to 1 here because our kids in this building have different needs than my kids in Canada had. And, and they need to have ongoing, regular, and immediate access to people who can support the social emotional health. Um, and and that, that, that is absolutely critical. And, so, and the other thing that's kind of interesting about this whole thing is there's certain central office functions. And as I said, we've had great support from the district. But there's certain central office functions now that we have to do. Um, and we have to shift some of those functions from central office to us. Um, we have a different group of kids with different issues, and we're not giving up on any of those kids. We want to create a road, a path to success for every student. And so that means different approaches, like the big picture schools, off-site uh, project-based learning, more credit recovery, East Evening. All of these have startup costs, and so some of the costs that are associated with our work are one-year or two-year only cost, but all of them are critical to ha if we're really serious about success for every student. I can tell you when I sit with my colleagues, they will allow me to give up on nobody. You know, the, 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 the issue here is how, what is our program for every single student in this building? And when we accepted this assignment, when you asked us to do this, our own sense of social justice said that we will focus on success for every student you have in this building. And not that you don't, you absolutely do. But we have to be satisfied that we have programs that are gonna meet their needs, okay? So I asked earlier, does anybody think that just because we're here um, that everything's gonna change? We're asking all the people who work here, all the people who are involved in, in, in the education of your sons and daughters and neighborhood kids, uh, to consider uh, a change in the entire, entire paradigm of public urban education. You know, there's a group in town doing wonderful, wonderful work. Great schools, you've seen them, talking about uh, uh, creating a system where no school would have less than 40% or more than 40% of the kids with free and reduced lunch. And, you know, it, it, and it really ends up being a countywide approach to public education. And that would be wonderful. But we've seen all of us have seen that there are many, many people in this larger region who wouldn't feel comfortable with that approach. So in my view, we only have three re reasonable approaches to, to making sure the kids in urban areas get a high quality educational program. The first is combined schools, which I don't think is gonna happen, into, you know, into the countywide approach. The second is to really build a model for success. And that model's gonna be more expensive at the onset, but I think from the social implications, the economic implications, a real bargain in the end. Because the changing kids' lives and getting them so they walk out of this building ready to assume their position in society to be positive contributors will have an impact that will far and away uh, cover the, whatever the investment costs are. So I go back to my paradigm, my back to my analogy rather, the right people, they're using best practice, 
building capacity creates a sense of the potential for success for all. And those three legs are the best people. Those, uh, and, and we're going to make sure the best people are here because we're going to talk to every person who wants to be here and make sure they really want to be here. Make sure they buy into the EPO proposal. They buy into our practices. And by the way, we're, we're not insisting that everybody's a superstar. We're insisting that everybody wants to do what's ever necessary to make themselves the best teacher or the best administrator or the best counselor or the best cleaner or the best cafeteria worker they can be. Um, everything we do, we guarantee, will be based on research, evidence-based best practice, and we will ask for enough capacity to be successful for all kids because our kids in this community deserve the very best in education they can get. I finish with a quote from John Dewey. I'll let you read that yourself. But the board members can't see it, so I'll read it for them. <laughs> what the best and wisest parent wants for his own child, that must be, that must the community want for all its children. What the best and wisest parent wants for his own child, forgive the masculine, that must the community want for all its children. Thank you very much. I'm willing to thank you. Field any questions from the board or from members of the audience? Seeing none? I guess I could start. I wanted to. So, so I would ask, may I ask uh, Van for you to call on people rather than me? Sure. Okay. Sure. okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I, I have a number of questions, but I'll try to, to uh, make them uh, quick. Um, there is, if you, if you read uh, work by Dr. Joy um, Leary, um, Joy DeGru Leary, who has written a book called Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And in that book, in African communities, they ask the question are the children well? And that is the way in which you determine the health of a community if the children are well. And so when you ask that question, um, it, it, it determines you know, the health of the community. And certainly, uh, uh, this community is not um, well. And so I want to, first of all, thank the University of Rochester for, uh, and I guess uh, President White's insistence of, <laughs> of the, the University of Rochester um, taking on this um, huge uh, effort. And let me just say, um, part of me was just doing cartwheels because Everything that you have said is what I've been trying to say for nine years on this board. Everything you've said. And so I'm, I'm so excited to know that um, we are moving in the right direction and that this uh, effort could be a model not only for this community and for the rest of the school district, uh, but also for the nation. So I'm so very thankful. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Elliott. Um, and I'll just go through a couple of the, the, the questions that I have, and you can just answer them you know, quickly, because I, I did take a lot of notes. Uh, but I also have the binder that I've um, I, I may reviewed. call on some of my colleagues to yeah. answer your questions, yeah. Mike. And, and some of these questions I just want to ask publicly so that they're um, on the record. Um, what urban districts have you found that closely matches uh, the Rochester City School District that is having uh, academic success? None. Mm. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, this, I haven't found a district that really closely matches the Rochester City School District. Um, other uh, urban areas, um, I've done extensive work in, in small cities, Mount Vernon, Newburgh, uh, Kingston, Port Jervis, that are poor cities. But uh, the challenges I think that you face in Rochester are unique. Um, I would open to my colleagues. Uh, are you thinking of another city that's being very successful that has a similar uh, makeup to the Rochester City School District? Anybody? So, and when we asked the, the state, this is, when we, we agreed to do this, we called the state, we said, can you send us an exemplar proposal so we could use it, you know, uh, we structure our own? And there was this long, pregnant pause. And finally, Irish Schwartz said, we were kind of hoping you guys would create the exemplar. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm sorry we were not able to find. In, in turn, you mentioned about uh, every staff person having leadership qualities, leadership capability. Um, are you expecting that um, the staff that you interview will have those qualities, or do you think that they can learn these leadership qualities through professional development? I absolutely believe that those are qualities people can learn, and these are qualities we want our kids to learn. 
No, the, the, the main thing is to build the leadership potential of the students. And there are great leaders already at East High School. I've worked with many of them. Um, and and to, if we can come together and build this common sense of purpose and mission, uh, we really have enormous potential to be successful in transforming the paradigm of the kids themselves, how they see themselves. I loved your quote that you know the communities well when the children are well. I maybe didn't get it precisely correct, but but their own social emotional health will drive their academic well-being. Um, one of the things that I've been advocating for in this district, again, since I've been here, is that we have a district whose student is 85% uh, people of color. And there's, always, there's this disconnect when you have a teaching staff that's 85% white female, or white, mostly female, and then you have a district student population that is um, people of color. And there's always going to be disconnect. There is some research that, that suggests that when you have uh, white females to, or female teachers, it is the males who get suspended the most. And in our case here in this uh, district, when you have a high population of white female um, teaching staff, it is the black boys who get suspended the most. And I guess I want to put that on your radar screen because the students that I've talked to throughout, and if you look at the uh, report that uh, the Youth Council did under Mayor Duffy, they talked about needing to see teachers that look like them. And that's really important. And so as you begin to in interview uh, people for this particular um, uh, program, I'm, I'm really uh, recommending that you look at people who can connect, um, who understand the culture, who understands that urban um, environment. That's going to be um, incredibly important in my opinion. Um, and, and one other thing I point out, um, many of you know I'm uh, the assistant to the executive director at Baden Street Settlement. We did a survey of our youth years ago and we did find that the highest question that, uh, uh, um, the highest rating on the question was in terms of adult uh, relationships. And so that's going to be very important that uh, the people who are in this building are able to develop effective relationships with our uh, young people. I think that's going to be crucial to their um, academic uh, success. Yeah, and we, so we will be very intentional about that. Okay. about developing relationships, about monitoring and adjusting and making sure that we're working to develop relationships okay. with kids and families. Thank you. And then I don't know what the, what is the percentage, maybe Annabelle can respond to this if he's still here, I don't, or, or you may know, what is the percentage of students who are bused in? And, and, and I know you talked about being more neighborhood focused, and so, but I don't know what the, you know, the, 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 the number of students who are bused in versus who come from the neighborhood. Okay. So less than ninety percent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice President Ellis, do you mind if I ask a follow-up question? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Annabelle, do you know if this neighborhood demographically has the capacity to have more walkers, or did they just choose? Are they choosing to go elsewhere? Right. Um, you, you mentioned that you, uh, when you visit your, visited the classrooms, every class you found it insightful. Talk a little bit about that. What, did you, what do you mean? I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Joanne Larson, if she would talk about, I, as I mentioned, I wasn't here that day. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I was traveling. Okay. But, Joanne, would you come up to the microphone? What we did was spend the entire day here, 20 of us from Warner, with in all the social studies classes and a couple of English classes. So we were able to meet every student who was here that day, estimating about 1,300. 
we put we had five questions that they answered on poster board um, that where they wrote uh, what are the challenges for adults and students at East what would they like to see in terms of courses uh, what would they like to see in terms of after school programming um, how can we engage families more and there was one more about uh, what would they like to what do they think needs to be changed uh, and we gave them a survey so I have that I'm happy to send you I have the data for that it should be in your appendix actually there are charts they were phenomenal the students were um, vocal they were honest some of them were you know they wrote stuff like candy you know a couple <laughs> but mostly they they want more uh, the things we use to make, help make decisions more AP more advanced classes they kind of fill out uh, academic and career they identified the health professions better food was huge uh, cosmetology was huge uh, driver's ed was huge mm -hmm. so it was really wonderful and my plan is to take that back to the students so they see what we found um, but they were they were amazing thank you in terms of um, um, attendance and this school has a less than 80 percent uh, attendance rate um, what does the plan call for in, ter in terms of ensuring that even though these students are out and many of them with legitimate reasons how do we ensure that we provide learning from them is there some technology that we can use in order to uh, continue the learning even though they're not in the seat so um uh, let me answer that question in, in two tiers okay the first tier is to say the best way to improve attendance is to make school a place kids want to be and uh, that is everything from uh, we already have wonderful things going on here, but to make that even more engaging and more enticing, to make sure the food's better and the seats are more comfortable. Um, I've been working on that for we, a long time too, the food. We, um, I've, I've told several of my colleagues that uh, at which time the board approves this plan, we will start to work on uh, uh, minute details such as um, what kind of technology we're going to use and how are we going to bring kids, how are we going to catch kids up who can't get to school. So, candidly, we haven't addressed that yet. Okay. But we, th we haven't addressed that and about 7,500 other things that uh, really, we, I call them all implementation issues and, and, and as soon as we are officially named as the EPO, we will begin working on implementation issues and as we've already uh, made it clear we would like uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll hire the uh, EPO executive deputy director rather who will be it'll be a full-time employee working um, you know 100 days uh, or rather 100 percent on on this project um, what's the what is the prob probationary period for the people that you hire so people system? who we hire who already have tenure will maintain their tenure who are two years into their probationary period will come into the third year so I don't in anticipate will disrupt the uh, seniority or probationary period uh, prob probationary period or tenure status of any individual okay and just one last question uh, mr. president how will you accept the criticism that definitely is going to come um, well, I'm, I have been know. a school superintendent for 23 years, and uh, one of the things I've learned uh, early and hard and often is you can't make everybody happy. Right. And if you think you're gonna, you really ought to be thinking about another line of work. And, and just lastly, you know, I, again, as I um, was interviewed by the press, uh, I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, I, I really um, am uh, encouraged um, with U of R and President Sieberman at the at the helm of this, and um, that it's a great opportunity. And um, you know, whatever I can do to help support this, please feel free to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, let me just um, thank uh, um, our, our board president for uh, the inordinate amount of work, work that he um, has put in. We'll thank him even better once we get the approval from the state and this, this plan is, is executed. Um, you know, U of R's motto, there are U of R affiliated folks here, um, other than the staff that are here, is Meliora, which is Latin. It means better, whereas U of R's motto, always better, better. And um, I think that that is important um, for us to remember as we, as we think about 
East High School, that we want it to be always better or better for our students here at East High School. And what I like um, in, in your presentation, um, Dr. Eubing, was um, the portion in which you talked about the leadership, the staffing, which I think is absolutely important. And, and I think it's important that the teachers that are here are going to be important, but also the, the leader, the person that's going to um, lead those upper and lower schools, um, I think is, is key. And I don't think it takes a rocket science to know that leadership really, really matters. And to pull off um, this, this detailed plan, I mean, I, I, it's a lot to get your arm around. It's, it's amazing how detailed this is, and I would urge everyone to read it. I mean, it's... It's, it's on the website, it is, it, it is it, it's excellent in terms of, it is what we want for all of our schools, hopefully, eventually. Um, but I, I think you really have to have, and I know you're gonna work hard at this, um, leaders that really can carry out this plan, because we can have this here on paper, it sounds great, but you know, um, you're gonna be at the helm, which, which I feel good about. But in terms of the people that are gonna be on the ground executing, um, making this happen, it, it's really gonna take. Um, someone who is innovative, um, creative, and, 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 and really able to connect with the, with the broader community, rally the staff together, get the parents on the same page. So um, uh, I'll be happy for that person, but I also will give them my condolences because it's not going to be an easy job. Um, but, but it's key. I mean, yeah. it's critical um, for all of us that, that that happens. So can you just comment briefly on the process that you plan on undertaking to ensure that you have the folks that will live up to Meliora um, and, 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 will, and, and will really um, go about carrying this and, and executing this with fidelity. Because this is very prescriptive. I mean, what, what you're saying there, you can't have someone, you know, you don't want a leader that says, oh, I don't want to add sugar. I, I want to add flour. I mean, this is, this is pretty um, no, I'm, I'm gonna call based on, two, on data. So two colleagues uh, to help answer that. I've asked my colleague Mike Ford to oversee the um, process for selecting the leader. And uh, in terms of, we will have for the first several years um, a person we're going to call chief academic officer who will uh, be in charge of uh, making sure the uh, curriculum is implemented with fidelity. So, uh, you know, this is like where you hope the professor doesn't call on you in class. <laughs> but if those two folks can come up and take about 30 seconds each and talk about those things, it'd be great. Mike, Mike by the way, is a former superintendent. At Mid Lakes and Susan Meyer was, uh, she hates when I say this, the greatest principal in the history of the world um, at Odyssey. Uh, selecting the leader for this position is a, a, a very critical task. We recognize that we've cast a broad net. Uh, we had a variety of applications from within the city as well as outside of the city. So we have local folks and folks from beyond. Uh, we will have a, interviews actually fairly shortly. Uh, on the first round, I've done a, a screening interview on all the candidates and we recognize the need for someone to wow this organization. And that will be a critical component. They've got to have strong leadership, strong vision, strong ability to manage, and a fortitude and a drive. And that's what we're looking for in the person that we're uh, going to select and recommend. I, I think I want to change implementing with fidelity to a, a range of implementing because if you've looked at the document, the curricula we're looking at is in various levels of completion and detail. So one of the things that I think is very important in this process to recognize is that the people who come together, I, I agree with you that leadership comes first that we have to put a design team together who will be also designers and developers. There's a lot of development work. It's not just implement with fidelity. It be, um, it's, we didn't have a, a plan in the back shelf that we brought and handed to people to implement. So there's um, a huge need for creativity, hard work, and of course that's gonna require leadership as well. But there's strong guidelines and various levels of implementation work to be done. I hope that helps. Thank you. I'm um, very excited about the, about the proposal. I know the board is, is very excited. People who I talk to um, on the streets are, are excited. And I always say it needs to pass the Mrs. Smith test. So if I'm walking down the street or in Wegmans and someone says, I like, I like what I'm hearing about, that, that, I, it means that the rank and file, the regular everyday Joes um, are, 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 are talking about this and, and excited about it. So um, I, I look forward to the future and, and obviously, um, I look forward to doing anything that I can do in my power to make sure that this is successful. Thank you. Sure. Um, 
first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, the presentation is really good quality. I appreciate the dimensions that are offered. Um, I know a few people from the Warner School a little bit, and I think they know that um, many of the dimensions really reflect things that I've talked with them about and that I value and have been trying to advance. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I have one specific question, and I, uh, I understand the rationale and appreciate the desire to have sixth graders. Um, but I know I was at a forum that um, Dr. Larson led and saw that there was really a pretty strong consensus among that group of parents opposed to having sixth grade. So in a way, I'm almost as interested in how that dialogue works out and how that negotiates and how well we listen to parents as we move forward as I am, you know, the the arguments on either side. So is there any update? I mean, is there still? So first and foremost, uh, we're not going to ask the board to require any sixth graders to come here. We're not going to ask you to uh, stop offering sixth grade at a certain school and so they have to come here. Uh, we're going to make that a parent option, a family option, and uh, we're going to study it very carefully. And we're, we also are going to have a cutoff date. And we, we may, if we don't get enough people who are really interested in doing this, we'll have to reconsider it. Um, but uh, we think there's merit because they'll have the same approach to literacy and mathematics for three years in a row, moving into ninth grade, and we'll have opportunities to, sig to improve significantly their, uh, their skill development, and especially in literacy and vocabulary acquisition. So given that as our goal, um, and we're not critical of the current elementary programs in the district, we just want um, to... Uh, uh, bring everybody under one umbrella. If the community says to us, we don't want to do that, we're going to, we're going to have to monitor and adjust. Have you, just one quick follow-up question on that. Have you explored ways of communicating with and um, sort of recruiting um, potential sixth grade students, fifth grade families within, within we, we, our schools, like only, on a school basis or a neighborhood basis? So is this it, is one of our uh, dilemmas in that we don't have this job yet. <laughs> yeah, right. And um, so we have had conversations about how to do that. We're starting to put together a strategy. We know that on January 10th is a recruitment day for Choose Your School. Uh, we've talked to some of the folks here at East about how to reach out into sixth graders, and we've talked to some of the people at Central who were actually, many were very supportive of us uh, looking at sixth graders. But uh, we haven't developed that strategy yet. Okay, thank you. If I could piggyback on that, and I'm sure uh, Steve knows this, and maybe many of the other folks in the audience, but for those who don't, um, it, it's intuitively obvious that if a school is already successful, folks will try to get in as early as possible, including getting the jump on their competition. Uh, if, if this were School of the Arts, uh, there, there'd be no question people would be lining up at the door to get in at sixth grade because Right now, it only it starts at seventh. So, um, if if East High can demonstrate success with the body of students it has, it could that will be its own best advertisement. Karen, thank you. I'd like to start off first by saying thank you, Mr. White, for pushing for this. Thank you, Dr. My question mm -hmm. being a parent, what can we as so parents so and guardians, community members and students do to assist in this process other than write our mouths which the <laughs> world knows quite well at doing? What else can we do to help? Well, appropriate running in the mouth is always a good thing. Okay. <laughs> we support that. Uh, I think and I've told parents, this, I've been asked this question many times, what can parents do to, to uh, support their children? First and foremost, at home, support the importance of their educational endeavors. Value it. Show that this is a big thing in this house. We care about what you bring home. What did you do in school today? I was superintendent of schools. My kids would come home and say, so what did you do in school today? I said, nothing. I said, nothing? I'm going to have to go in and close that school. No, come on, Dad, you know. Uh, you know the, um, and, and talk about what they've done and, and, and show a real appreciation and a value. If, if it's important in the family, if school is important in the family, if it's seen as a family value, that will inevitably 
impact how a child sees their own educational journey <clears throat> more than anything else you can do. I mean, we love it, excuse me, <clears throat> when parents come up and help with stuff, we love that, when parents uh, support us. But the most important support a parent can have uh, in terms of a child's education is how they value and demonstrate the value of education in their own home. Uh, sir? So thank you very much for that. And I, I wish you would, had been a fly on the wall in our uh, career and technical education subcommittee where those very discussions were held and very similar kinds of uh, conclusions were reached to the ones you just voiced. Bless you. Marilyn? Just real quick, Ben, before you go next, uh, just got to give a plug for Donald's class in 1952 at uh, the high school. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we met today. He's got a lot of ideas. Say this not to embarrass him, but he has given his own money for scholarship with the Rochester Children's Scholarship Fund for 20 ninth grade students here who wow. uh, have a different stand the metric, and he will follow them for their entire four years of high school with the goal of giving them a couple of thousand dollars when they graduate but while they're in school, as long as they maintain a certain GPA, he is giving them uh, a, a, basically a cash incentive for maintaining wow. the marking period. So just want to make sure that the legacy of this school is very big in this community. And it's individuals like Don that come back out of the woodwork, out of nowhere, to get back. And I just think that's just important to recognize. Thank you. Where were you when I was in school? <laughs> Where were you when I was in school? <laughs> hey, I'll tell you, I, I would love more B students too. So we would take as many B students as we get. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Harold?
Uh, I'm going to ask my colleague, Dr. Bonnie Rubenstein, to come up and address our, um, uh, our approach to social emotional health. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> So we know that we cannot, there's only so much we can do. We can't change the neighborhoods, but we can change what happens when the kids come here. And we're gonna look at every single student. We're gonna give every single student so much support and help to build their self-esteem because we know the first thing we did was review decades of meta-analysis of hundreds and hundreds of studies that show that if you deal with the socio-emotional, that that leads to academic achievement. We also know, and all of you know about the literature and, the, and all of the talk about the school to pipeline. And we know that the more kids are suspended, then the likelier they are to drop out. And we know that when they're dropped out, the likelier they are to be incarcerated. So we're gonna change. You saw restorative practices on the screen. So we have all kinds of things planned, including uh, peace circles, uh, peer mediation, training every staff member, having the counselors work and train the teachers on, the on things that we can do with the families that are gonna be meeting every day. So we have been talking about this daily since April, and I thank you for your concern. Steve, I, I think we'll take, I, I think I see um, one more question, and uh, two, and then we'll wrap it up. Ma late, young lady in the back. Hook us up. So, um, yeah, th that's one of the many issues that aren't in the presentation, but we do, uh, one of our goals is to put a, um, a, a 
a computer in the hands of every child when they walk in the door, have it with them all day long, uh, have them sign it out when they, when they leave at the end of the day. Uh, also, much of our credit recovery approach will be computer generated. Uh, technology, you know, the thing about kids today is they, it's just second nature to them. Did I do that? Okay. No, I'm it's just, I it's did just that. second I'm nature to them. I, I mean, my kids make fun of me when I try to text on my phone because it's one after another after another, and they've sent seven messages by then. I'm still trying to figure out how to program the VCR. But they, <coughs> it's technology will be fundamental to the education of the kids in this building. So, Van, what I, I would like to do with your permission is close and turn the floor over to, uh, to Joel and let him make some closing remarks. Sure. Hey, Joel, as you take the mic, uh, let me just say I saw Adam walk out. Um, oh. I don't know if someone could get oh, Adam's he's right. attention. He's still there. But um, I wanted to, to say a couple things. On, on a number of occasions, uh, uh, Willie, you don't have to run. We're not that tight at time. <laughs> um, Joel, before you make your cl the closing remarks, let me just say uh, on a number of occasions people have uh, uh, thanked me for my work on this and uh, have indicated that I had this never say never attitude. Um, but I, I do not need to be thanked. Uh, this is my job and I'm blessed and honored that my colleagues have uh, given me this opportunity. Uh, and in terms of the never say no attitude, there is not a single person who I have asked, uh, maybe repeatedly, to help out where they have not, in turn, given back to this community um, the same kind of never say never attitude. I often quote Susan B. Anthony, failure is impossible, but there are people in this room, and I'm terrible at names, and I know I will forget some names, but I did, I did want you to leave Adam without uh, you and Kyle, and I know there are other union reps here too. We have people from ASAR, we have people from uh, Bente and RAP, um, uh, did I miss anybody? No, I think I got them all. Um, who also made a commitment to never say never. And I want to be very clear about this. We have still a bit of a journey to go. Um, but we are very, very fortunate that I think everybody realizes that a lot is at stake. And so I just wanted to say to Adam, who uh, was there when I initially asked the question, to Joel and to Rafaela, I, I saw her around here somewhere, and to Joanne um, and to Kyle more recently. Um, and and I, I know I'm going to forget people, so please don't hold me accountable for that. But there are a lot of people in this room and in this community who uh, have a never say never attitude, who have a failures and possible frame of mind. And uh, we owe the success to, uh, of this uh, initiative where we're at right now to them. And for those people who aren't in this room, and there's hundreds of them that are not in this room, uh, who will make this uh, initiative a success, to them, the debt of gratitude is owed. So, so. And Van, I want to start just by quickly calling out three individuals who deserve particular uh, gratitude. And we start with Steve. Um, I'm, He is a gifted leader, and he's put together an extraordinary team at Warner. He's inspired all of us. He's uh, worked with so many at East High School, on the school board, with the school district superintendent's office, with parents, with so many others. And, and it's, it's hard to overstate how much the ultimate achievement, if we get there, um, is due to the fact um, as Steve likes to put it, we've got a great coach. And please, one more round of applause for Steve. <laughs> I want to thank Adam. And I want to be really clear. Um, the Rochester Teachers Association has stretched for this. This is not easy. Um, we're basically saying for East High School to succeed, we're going to have to do some dramatically different things. And they're longer hours, and they're longer year. And when you, we talk about, in effect, each teacher being involved with a family, you know, you can count the number of minutes in the day, but all of us have been involved in families, and there are more minutes at night. 
and it's a commitment, and it's extraordinary. And Adam and the leaders of the East High School contingent are just remarkable people. I mean, we've reached now agreements with three of the four unions. We're not quite there yet with the RTA. But what they're willing to say is they share our passion. They want to prove, as all of us, the University of Rochester committed to this project, they want to prove that urban high schools that are unionized, that are in neighborhoods with intense poverty can succeed. There is nothing, nothing more painful than listening to people saying we have to convert totally to charters or education in urban cities can't work. This is our moment. Mm -hmm. This is our moment to basically demonstrate that K through 12 can succeed anywhere if you have the right passion, the right flexibility, the right commitment to change, and the absolute conviction that Van has articulated, failure is impossible. Amen. Say it with me. Failure, failure is, is impossible. impossible. Failure, failure is, is impossible. impossible. And I want someday not only to see a start this project, but I want to see every student who enters East High School when we begin, you know, given a hoodie, and let's front we'll probably say East High School, but the back should say failure is impossible because we want every student to know he or she matters. <laughs> and I want to thank the school board. Um, one of the gentlemen, the last I think who posed the question said, we didn't talk about money today. And obviously we'll have to before <laughs> this is done. And we've given you a hint, this can be expensive. And you guys know you're gonna have to stretch to do this. And why are we here? Because you've given every intimation you wanna stretch. You've given every intimation that you want to create a model not just here, but potentially for your school district and maybe nationally, as some have suggested, how to make high schools challenged like this one successes. When Steve began, he alluded to the fact we were asked, as he put it, once by Van to take on this project. The truth is we were asked three times mm -hmm. by Van. He is very perseverant. And I know I looked him in the eye and I've talked to all of you at various points and basically said, do you really mean it? <laughs> do you really believe failure is impossible? Because this is shock therapy. Mm -hmm. This is a huge change. It is a change in the culture of a high school. It's not used to winning recently. We're going to change that. That's why we're on board. And most of all, when I talk about, if I may paraphrase Dr. King, my fierce urgency of now, it's for the students at East High School. It's for the fact that something like 56, I'm sorry, 57 or 58 percent don't graduate each year. They deserve better, and we know how to deliver it. And so I'm looking for, we got problems to solve, we got every challenge in the world, I am looking forward to supporting all of you in this room as we go forward. Have no delusions. This is not easy. This is not a musical comedy. There are no easy, happy endings. We start, if we get through the next few weeks, if we can agree on every labor contract, if we can agree on a budget, the state, I'm pretty confident, will support us if we do those things. But then comes the hard part. Because as everybody has recognized, this little poem <laughs> that we wrote you, this description of what we think needs to succeed, it's no good if it's on paper. It only matters if we implement it and if we have the honesty and conviction where things don't work to change it and if we keep the level of intensity and conviction and passion. 
Ja. I will tell you, you know, a secret. There are a lot of skeptics on the University of Rochester board about this one. Mm. And I have told them there is nothing more important to re than remembering we are the University of Rochester. Mm -hmm. It is a city with excessive levels of poverty. It is a city with inadequate levels of graduation and college preparedness. It is our city. And just as we uh, have had some progress and some success in recent years, we know our success and our progress is bound up with the city we love. I hope for the day when every high school is succeeding, every K through 12 school is succeeding. It's hard, I know you have to take every detail seriously. You need great individuals working as hard as these teams are to do it. This is a first step on a very long journey. But never forget what Van meant when he quoted Susan B. Anthony. Failure is impossible. Let's say it once more. Failure, Failure is, is impossible. impossible. If we work together, we're going to succeed in this. And nothing can be more important for the future of Rochester than great K through 12 education. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, I can get a motion to adjourn our meeting. Seconded. Seconded. The meeting is adjourned. Thanks a lot. Have a nice evening and a good holiday.